Today, we're going to cover the Ben 10 Ultimate Alien series from beginning to end in detail. Ben 10 Ultimate Alien is the third installment of the Ben 10 franchise following Ben 10 Classic and Ben 10 Alien Force. The story continues just a few months after the events of Ben 10 Alien Force, so without further ado, let's jump right in. The show starts with a bang when Ben's secret identity as an alien superhero gets exposed to the world. His house gets swarmed by the media, causing a huge commotion. The gang tracks down the culprit who spilled the beans, and guess what? It's a 10-year-old kid named Jimmy Jones. He claims to be Ben's biggest fan and thought it would be cool for everyone to know what Ben does for a living, but little did he know, it just made Ben's life way harder. On top of that, they stumble upon some footage of an unknown alien attacking military guards, so they decide to investigate further. They roll up to the military base in Kevin's new ride, where Colonel Rosam tells them that an alien has been sneaking into the camp and swiping parts from their spaceship in progress. When the alien arrives, the Ultimatrix scans it and adds its DNA to the watch. Ben turns into Chromastone to fight him, but much to their dismay, the alien runs away with the fusion core. Now, here's a question. We learned in Ben 10 Alien Force that Asmith has already stored the DNA of millions of aliens on Galvin Prime. So, uh, why did the Ultimatrix feel the need to scan this mysterious alien for its DNA? Don't worry though, we will learn this soon enough. Anyways, they track down the alien in an underwater cave and discover that he's been swiping parts to repair his spaceship because he desperately wants to get back home. But here's the catch. In order to launch the ship, he'd have to blow up the entire city of Florida and, well, our heroes are just not about to let that happen. Ben transforms into Ultimate Spider Monkey and restrains the alien, who reveals himself as Bivalvin. He came from the Andromeda Galaxy and, along with four others, was captured by a guy named Agrigor. They managed to escape from him, but got separated and ended up stranded on Earth. So this right here answers our previous question. You see, Azmuth had initially included DNA from aliens within the Milky Way Galaxy in the Ultimatrix. However, since Bivalvin hails from the Andromeda the galaxy, the watch needed to obtain a sample of his alien DNA. Okay, now back to the story. So Ben leaves by Valvin restrained in the cave and calls the plumbers for assistance, but sadly, Agrigor arrives first and abducts him once again. Now, remember how by Valvin mentioned four other aliens that Agrigor abducted? Well, sometime later, one of those aliens named Galapagus arrives on Earth looking for Ben's help. You see, his planet was attacked by Agrigor, who wanted to absorb the powers of his kind. Galapagus was abducted into his ship where he met the other four aliens by Valvin, Pandor, Andreas, and Rad. However, this poses yet another question. So Agrigor is an Osmosian like Kevin who can absorb powers at will. Um, why did he feel the need to abduct five different aliens when he could simply absorb them on the spot? Well, you see, Osmosians can only attain 10% of the total power when they absorb a creature. However, Agrigor has found a way to fully absorb all of their powers. These five aliens are super strong. In fact, absorbing the powers of all five at the same time would make Agrigor the strongest being in the entire galaxy, which is exactly why he brought them onto his ship. However, they managed to escape and crash landed on Earth. They decided to split up to find help, but we already know how that's going so far. Ben scans Galapagus and sends him home with the plumbers, but little did he know, the plumber was Agrigor in disguise. So, two down and three more to go. Pandor is trapped in this super tough metal armor that contains his powers and keeps his dangerous radiation in check. So desperate to get out, he offers a hefty sum of money to anyone who can crack open his suit. And guess who shows up? Why, it's Kevin! This guy never misses a chance to make a quick buck! However, Kevin refuses to open the suit when his plumber badge detects strong radiation coming from inside. But later, Kevin falls for a trick and accidentally accidentally opens the suit and out pops this glowing, red, lava-like figure which gets stronger by absorbing energy. Turns out that Pandor is crazy powerful and the gang realizes they'll need to outsmart him in order to get him back into the suit. Eventually, they succeed in locking him back up and keeping him restrained. Things start looking all under control and then two plumbers arrive to send Pandor back to his home planet. But just as you'd expect, their ship gets attacked by Agrigor, who now has three out of the five
five aliens in his possession. Wow, things just got a whole lot more intense. But on a side note, Ben has scanned all three of the aliens he's met so far, and he even transforms into Water Hazard, which is the species of Bivalvin. One cool thing about this show that separates it from the other Ben 10 shows is that this time, we get to see all the new aliens in action even before Ben can use them. I think this is a much better way to introduce new aliens because, well, before that, Ben would only unlock new aliens by accident. Now, even though that was exciting, Ben now has so many aliens now that it would become overwhelming to use the same concept. So, you know, props to the team for making this change. Alright, now let's get back to the plot. So, the next target is Andreas. You see, Andreas is a powerhouse, but a little weaker on the brain's end. This is why he has teamed up with Argit, who wants to rule the Forever Knights. And uh, one thing we know about Argit is that he cannot be trusted. I mean, the guy's a jerk. The gang arrives at the castle and learns that Argit uses Andreas's powers to inflict fear upon the Forever Knights, making them steal smoothies and pizzas from all across the city. His kingdom doesn't last long though because an honorable knight, Sir Dagonet, arrives and turns all of the knights against Argit. He quickly takes off his robe and says that Ben and his team were forcing him to pretend to be the leader of the Forever Knights. See, what did I tell you? This guy just can't be trusted. Nevertheless, Argit and the rest are all put in prison and Dagonet reveals that Andreas is going to be executed for his crimes. Ben and the rest ambush his execution ceremony, prompting Dagonet to initiate the self-destruct on his weapon and just dip. Seeing that there's no other option left, Andreas selflessly absorbs the explosion and sacrifices himself to save hundreds of lives. However, sometime later, Agrigor arrives on Earth and finds him still barely alive under all the rubble. He takes him back to his ship, and now he is only one step away from achieving his goal. Alright, so the last alien in the group is Rad, who finds out about his friend's capture and blames Ben for allowing it to happen. But here's the thing, all this time, Ben and the gang had no clue about Agrigor's plans. They believed that all the previous aliens had safely returned to their home planets. But guess what? Each time the ultimate Matrix scanned those aliens, it unknowingly emitted a homing signal that Agrigor used to track them down. Rad, using his powers, manages to halt the scanning process and vanishes. And wouldn't you know it, just moments later, Agrigor shows up on the scene in search of Rad. Talk about perfect timing, huh? Agrigor proves to be a formidable opponent, overpowering everyone in the group. Meanwhile, Ben finds himself left with just one alien available on his watch, which just so happens to be Rad. In a very clever move, the team manages to escape using Gwen's teleportation spell. But here's the twist. Rad has imprisoned himself within the Ultimatrix, and by doing so, he successfully conceals his presence from Agrigor, who can no longer track Ben since the watch is offline. Now, although Rad's plan is genius, there is a catch. He desires to take over Ben's body permanently, which is something that they just can't allow. The group acts swiftly and removes Rad from Ben's body, but guess what? Agrigor shows up just moments later and starts handing out some serious beatdowns. It's a tense moment, but Rad comes to a selfless realization. He will never be able to escape Agrigor's clutches. So, in a very heroic act, Rad sacrifices himself, willingly surrendering to Agrigor to save the gang. Now, Agrigor has obtained all five aliens, but Ben has scanned them all into his watch as well. The stage is set for an epic showdown the next time these two adversaries cross paths. Meanwhile, remember how Agrigor killed a couple of plumbers to abduct Pandor? Well, the plumbers ambush him to retaliate, but he manages to get away. However, before he can fully take off, one of the plumbers attacks Agrigor's ship, destroying his hyperdrive and preventing Agrigor from leaving Earth. The gang is informed about the situation, so they rush to his hideout only to be lured into a deadly trap. Luckily, they all survive, but there is no sign of Agrigor. Sometime later, Colonel Rosum informs them that Agrigor has been planning to use the time machine that they built 50 years ago. Conveniently, Professor Paradox arrives and, well, weirdly enough, he asks Kevin to always remember who his friends are. Oh boy, I hope this doesn't become a major plot twist later. Anyways, 
The gang breaks into the base, but before they could stop him, Agrigor manages to absorb all five of the aliens and becomes the strongest being in the entire galaxy. And as you would expect, Agrigor is unstoppable now, but his hunger for power does not end here. Asmuth shows up and reveals that Agrigor is now heading for the Map of Infinity. Now, what exactly is the Map of Infinity? Well, it's kind of like the key to travel anywhere in space or time at will. So yeah, this item is so important that Paradox himself split it into four keys and hid them all over the galaxy. Now, Agrigor wants to obtain these keys to become the strongest being in the universe. But how does one become the strongest being by simply obtaining the power to travel through space and time? Well, he plans to use the key to go to the Forge of Creation to obtain unlimited power. The Forge of Creation is the holy grail of power. It's the birthplace of the universe's greatest energy, and it's the place where ideas come to life. This place is hidden away from everyone, except for the Celestial Sapiens, the beings who reside there. It's also the place where Alien X is born, and well, you know, that kind of just explains it. So the gang now has to stop Agrigor from obtaining at least one of these keys. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, that's where things get interesting. The group tries to steal the first key by going into this maze-like temple before him, but doing so means they disarm all the traps for Agrigor to follow. While they're stuck holding a door open for Gwen, he just casually walks in and yoinks that first key. What a total badass! The next key is located at the core of an underwater planet, but this time, Agrigor beats them to it. So that means two down and two more to go. The gang seeks the help of Charmcaster to follow Agrigor into the door of anywhere. The door leads them to a world of mana called Ledger Domain, a place that greatly enhances the powers of mana holders. The two settle their differences and work together to locate the key, but once again, Agrigor uses the group as bait and gets his hands on it. Now, he only has the last key to obtain, and uh, things aren't looking so great for our heroes. So, Azmuth does his teleportation thingy and zaps the gang to a whole new galaxy. And guess what? They stumble upon this crazy huge planet called the Perplexahedron, which is shaped like a massive cube. But wait, Agrigor is already on the move, aiming straight for this planet. Our heroes ain't about to let him have all the fun though. They follow him inside, but he manages to slip in using his three pieces of the Map of Infinity. Once inside the Perplexahedron, our gang is in for a wild ride. They encounter all sorts of traps and challenges, and finally come face to face with Sentinel, the guardian of the last key. Sentinel knows what's up with Agrigor and hands over the key to Ben. He advises Ben to press on as the place is falling apart, but he doesn't want to leave him behind, so he returns to save his life. You know, I gotta say, not the brightest moment of Ben. He fights Agrigor, but it goes about as well as you would expect. Agrigor now has all four pieces of the map, and it's only going to get worse from here on. Asmuth isn't too happy about their loss because he himself has no idea where the Forge of Creation lies. But don't worry, because Professor Paradox does. He reveals that Agrigor plans to absorb power from a newborn alien X in the Forge, which will make him the strongest being in the entire universe. He teleports the gang outside the Forge and leaves them at the entrance, as he cannot go any further. The gang is on their own from there, and they must stop Agrigor before he gets his hands on a baby alien X. After getting attacked by Agrigor's minions, their ship gets stuck in a field of time, where they encounter a younger Ben. Precisely, the Ben from Ben 10 Classic, who is just as obnoxious as I remembered. Anyways, the gang flies to the baby alien X where they fight Agrigor once again, but just as you would expect, they all get their asses handed over to him. As a last resort, the younger Ben offers Kevin to absorb his Omnitrix, but Kevin chooses to absorb the Ultimatrix instead. With his newly acquired strength, he easily overpowers Agrigor and even absorbs his powers. But in doing so, he loses control of who he is. After Kevin flies off in a rage, Paradox arrives and congratulates Ben for saving the universe. However, his troubles aren't over, because he still has to deal with the Kevin problem. Thank you. 
Meanwhile, Kevin has locked himself in the Null Void to seek revenge against the Warden, who was responsible for the death of his friend Quarrel. Quarrel was the only person who showed him kindness and taught him to control his powers. Meanwhile, Ben and Gwen arrive at the prison to stop Kevin, but Ben now wants to kill him after seeing how unpredictable he's become. This leads to a heated feud between Gwen and Kevin, as Gwen wants to help Kevin instead of taking him down. They come across Argit, who reveals that Kevin is out for revenge after being double-crossed multiple times. They bring Argit to a plumber's academy for safety, but Kevin storms in, causing chaos and harming plumbers. He even attempts to kill Ben and Gwen, but ultimately leaves due to their history. Kevin's craving for unlimited power has led him to attack his former allies, such as Alan, Helen, Pierce, Manny, and even Dr. Victor for powers, and Ben has had enough of him. This causes a brawl between the cousins as Ben ends up knocking Gwen out. This Kevin thing is really taking a toll on our team, huh? Gwen seeks help from Morningstar and uses some spells to give him his original appearance back. She's hoping that Morningstar would come up with a way to help Kevin and even manages to convince Ben, but Kevin just doesn't seem to be coming around. Oh, and remember that nerd Cooper? Well, this is him now. Cooper, with his genius, builds a machine to absorb Kevin's powers and Ben gives Gwen an ultimatum of one hour before he takes Kevin down for good. After an intense battle, they all manage to restrain Kevin and use Cooper's machine to turn him back to normal. However, Morningstar, of course, tries to double-cross the team by absorbing the power, but Ben had already anticipated that. With the press of a button, he sends the power back to where it belongs, and Kevin returns to his senses soon after. The group not only saves Kevin, but also brings Bivalvin, Galapagos, Pandor, Andreas, and Rad back to life. Sometime later, the Forever Knights accidentally break open an ancient seal that was imprisoning Dagon, a legendary mind-controlling creature from another dimension. His release triggers an old man named George, who, until now, resided in a convalescent home. After checking on the seal, George breaks into Area 51 and makes the whole vicinity disappear, leaving only a crater behind. Just who is this freaky old man? Well, later we learn that he's the founder of the Order. Yeah, the original and first first ever Forever Knight, who has existed for a thousand years. When Dagon first appeared a thousand years ago, he was the one who pulled its heart out using the magical sword. Yet, Dagon did not die. However, the heart was the essence of all of Dagon's power, and it was sealed away somewhere on Earth. So the question is, how did George get his hands on that magical sword? Well, as it turns out, it was Azmuth who created it purely out of curiosity. However, the sword was stolen and used to destroy an entire planet, which made him realize the error of his ways. Later, when Dagon's mind-controlling minions appeared on Earth, all the knights turned against each other. Azmuth chose the knight with the strongest will, who just so happened to be George the Immortal. He gave him the sword called Ascalon to defeat Dagon, and this is how he managed to get his hands on the sword. Coming back to the present, the Forever Knights are holding a council of all their houses to discuss Dagon when George joins in and they all bow to him after recognizing who he is. He reminds them that the Forever Knights existed to eradicate all existing alien life on planet Earth, and unites them to target many aliens, including Pierce Wheels, who is apparently dead now. George appoints Driscoll as his second-in-command and sends him to hunt more aliens. However, Ben kicks his ass and stops the purge. Well, at least for now. Later, George reveals that he's leaving on a quest to find his sword Ascalon and asks the Knights to be ready upon his return for the Battle of a Hundred Lifetimes. While the Forever Knights wait on George to return, a cult called the Flame Keeper's Circle that worships Dagon is formed. These people claim to have found the injured body of the dragon, but upon inspection, Ben learns that it's the injured body of Vilgax from the last episode of Alien Force. Yeah, the once almighty conqueror of the world has been reduced to a half-dead octopus in a fish tank, pretending to be the leader of a cult. Talk about character development, am I right? Anyways, the Flame Keepers are taking him to the heart of Dagon, using which he can obtain all of its powers. Both Forever Knights and the Flame Keepers locate the shrine where they find the magical sword implanted in Dagon's heart. A fight breaks between the groups, and Vilgax uses this
this opportunity to obtain the power of the heart. However, his next destination is the Seal of Dagon, which will grant him even more strength. Vilgax disappears after cracking the seal, but all hope is not lost as George has gotten his hands on Ascalon, the magical sword he used to defeat Dagon the first time. Sometime later, an all-out war breaks out between the Forever Knights and the Flamekeeper's circle because one group wants to free Dagon while the other wants to kill it. When George reaches the seal, he's confronted by Vilgax, who now works as a herald to Dagon. The seal breaks and Dagon returns, but as it turns out, Vilgax never intended to serve him. In fact, he had this machine prepared to absorb Dagon's power. Meanwhile, George tries to fight Dagon, but dies in the process, and then Vilgax arrives with his machine and becomes the new Dagon. Wow, a lot happened real quickly, huh? Ben fights Vilgax, but not by using the Ultimatrix. Instead, he's using the sword George left behind. In the end, Ben manages to absorb all of Dagon's power from Vilgax, and Vilgax urges him to use this power to eradicate all evil from the world. With such tremendous power at his disposal, Ben really considers Vilgax's advice. But in the end, he remembers everything he's been through and uses this power to undo all the destruction caused by Dagon. Seeing as Ben has matured so much, Azmuth arrives and gives him a new version of the Ultimatrix for the next show to come. Alright, so that right there was the entire timeline of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. But you guys remember Ben 10,000, right? Well, in this crazy future, he gets attacked by a guy called Eon who's on a mission to hunt down Bens from different dimensions. But guys, don't worry. Ben 10,000 kicks his butt and saves the day. Just when he thinks he's done, Paradox shows up and, well, tells him that his troubles have only just begun. He teleports Ben 10,000 into the present where they meet our regular 16-year-old Ben. On a side note, this Ben 10,000 is from a different future than the one with whom Ben met when he was 10 years old. Anyways, the two try to destroy a portal that Eon can use to travel in this time, but it turns out that it was a trap set by him to activate the seal. As both Bens fight Eon, they learn that all of his minions are mind-controlled 16-year-old Bens from different timelines and that Eon himself is a Ben 10,000 from a different dimension. So basically, this version of Ben 10,000 went evil and he abducted other Bens to use as his slaves. Soon after, the evil Ben 10,000 is defeated when his seal is destroyed, which also reverts all the damages he has caused in different dimensions. Before leaving with the good Ben 10,000, Paradox gives a warning to the team about the creature from beyond. Alright folks, we've finally made it to the end of the video, but let's go through the aliens that Ben turned into. We had Water Hazard, Amphibian, Armodrillo, Terraspin, NRG, Fast Track, Chameleon, Eedle, Clockwork, Shock Squatch, and Jury Rig. This was the timeline of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.